All right, now that you've gone through the discussion and answered the discussion question, what is science? Now you can play this video. And again, all these videos are structured. The PowerPoints will be available after you play the video, so you can go through the slides on your own. But with the video, you should just watch it. You can hit pause, of course, anytime that you want. And there's some points in here where I'm going to ask you to hit pause, think about something before you go forward. And if you just keep going, it's going to be some dead time. So let's go through. Uh, and a lot of times I'll break things up into a couple of videos. This one, it might be a little bit on the longer side, but if I break it up into two, it's going to be too small. The breaks will be just in weird places. So it's a good introductory, what this class is about lecture. All right, so let's start with what science is and the method. A good definition, and some of you have some of you hit this spot on. Uh, science is a body of information and approach to problems based on observation and experiment. And very specifically, what this means is observations are things that are measurable, and an experiment means it's something that's testable. Right? So you could say science is measurable and testable. And that means for something to be scientific, it has to meet that criteria. So there's a, there's there's some very interesting conversations out there that we people get into that are just not scientific. It doesn't mean they're not important and it doesn't mean they're not interesting. So we don't want to get into a kind of an elitist view of this is more important than that. But it's also very important to understand this is what science is and this is what it is not. So if you can't really measure it or test it, it's kind of hard to be scientific with it. All right. So let's go through the steps of the scientific method. They're listed here, so you can just look at what the list is. I'm going to thread a couple examples through this, but I'm going to go through each thing uh, on its own. So and you've probably seen this before, but this is my take on it. So science starts with an observation. And an observation is anything you can see, hear, touch, taste, feel. Smell also smells kind of like taste. All right? Anything you can see, hear, touch, taste, or feel would be an observation. Now, if you were to walk into a modern scientific lab, you would see all sorts of interesting devices, and you'd see like a metal rod with a wire coming out of it attached to a computer, or a black box or a gray box that a bunch of tubes are attached to and things coming out of them. All these things do is they expand our senses. So for example, I'm sure many of you have worked with a microscope or a telescope to see things that are really far away or things that are really small or a thermometer to measure temperature, right? You can hold something in your hand and go, oh, this is hot, but you might, you can't say, oh, it's 84 degrees, but a thermometer can help you with that. Even things like electrical current, we can learn a lot from conductivity of electricity. Again, we can go, you know, we can feel a shock, but we can't tell you how many volts that is, and certainly if it's below a certain amount, you can't even feel it. So just some examples I'm going to thread through here. The story of Newton's apple, right, and also the discovery of saccharin are good examples of the scientific method. So the story of Newton's apple, right? Uh, Newton's sitting under an apple tree. Apple falls down, right? Bonk hits him on the head. Newton makes an observation. The apple fell down. That's it. That's where the observation stops. Uh, saccharin, interestingly, which is a sweetener. It's not used that much anymore, but it's an older sweetener. Uh, was discovered accidentally by bad practice. The scientists uh, left the lab, didn't wash their hands, and had dinner. Right? The scientist's name was Constantine Falberg. Uh, noticed a sweet taste on his hand one evening and connected this and figured out that it was saccharin. That's the chemical name of saccharin. But the observation was this tastes sweet. Right? Now, observations happen all the time. It doesn't become scientific really until you ask the question. So apples have been falling off trees way before Isaac Newton asked the question. So the question might be, well, why did the apple fall down? Falberg's question, why is this sweet? Why is my hand sweet? My hand's not supposed to be sweet. That's when it becomes a scientific problem is when we ask the question about the observation. Now, the next step, this is where it gets interesting, is what do we do after we ask the question? We try to answer the question. Now, you're going to see several times in this class that there's going to be some words that come up that you're going to hear that, that you've heard before, but you've, the definitions are, can be very different scientifically. And this has caused some problems, and this, so this will be one of the first examples. Because when scientific information gets out into the general population, and scientists use certain words, scientists are thinking it means one thing, but the general population hears something else and thinks it means something else. And for example, the word theory and hypothesis. Right, and I'll talk about this as we go through. 
but a hypothesis is not the same thing as a theory. Theory you've heard, all right? So a hypothesis is an educated guess to answer the question. And it, educated means it's not just a random guess. It's based on things we already know. So for example, Newton's question, why did the apple fall down? So what do we know? Well, we know everything falls down. So what are some possible hypotheses? Well, one, something's pulling it down, right? We all know now gravity, but Newton's time, they didn't know about that. Uh, but another hypothesis, and I don't know if this happened or not, could be something is pushing it down. Whoops, what the heck? Okay, I'm pushing buttons with the mouse. All right, uh, fall broke. Uh, and um, uh, something pushing it down, you know, obviously that's wrong, but again, it wouldn't be a guess in those days. Fall broke, um, why are my hands sweet? Hey, that's the question. Well, I know I didn't wash my hands. So my hypothesis, maybe something from the lab is on my hands. And then even another question, well, what did I work with? So you see how the, the observation generates the question and which generates the, the guess to answer it. So to answer the question, what we do is we form what are called, we do what are called controlled experiments. So this is the testable part. So take a moment, hit pause, and think, what does controlled mean? But don't say the word controlled in your answer. Hit pause and then I'll come back. All right, so let's see if you come up with something. Controlled in this context means that you're testing one variable at a time. So if there's three things that could cause something to happen, you have to test all three of them at the same time. So for example, let's say I did a chemical reaction and I noticed that I left it, I, I mixed two chemicals and then I left the room and I came back in an hour and it turned green, but I also noticed that the room was a lot warmer. So I want to know, well, did it turn green because it got warm or did it turn green because I waited an hour? So what would I do? Well, I might do the reaction at two different temperatures and see if the temperature did it. And then I might do the reaction and let it sit longer or let it sit less time, right? But again, I'm separating them. See, that's the difference. Test one variable at a time. So for example here, let's say Fallberg had worked with three compounds that day. Let's just call them A, B, and C. So another one, hit pause. What tests would you do? Hit pause, see if you can figure out, make, see what you would test to do it control. All right, to come up with some ideas, this is what I came up with. I would test each thing separately. A by itself, B by itself, C by itself. Then I might, after that, what if none of those are sweet? Then maybe I would start doing mixtures, right? Maybe they're not sweet on their own, but then it's, I would do these mixtures, A, B, A, C, B, C, A, B, C. And maybe it's none of them. Maybe it was just the glassware I used had something else that was spilled on it. But you see how without even trying, I've got seven experiments to do. Now, controlled, and it's not always easy because we don't always know what all the variables are. Okay, so controlled experiments can do two things. They can either they can tell us we were wrong. I mean, it was a guess anyway, right? So that's why we're testing it. And this does happen frequently, but we frequently don't hear about it in the general population because we don't publish hypotheses that are proven wrong, right? So we wait until we have some stuff that's proven right. There's a lot of science. If you're a researcher, you not if you're thinking of going into research, just so you know, you're going to try a lot of stuff that doesn't work because you don't know. You're sailing uncharted waters, all right? What do we do if it tells us our hypothesis is wrong? We guess again. We made one guess. Well, let's try something else. Right? We could back up here. None of the three things I worked with were sweet. So now I'm going to guess. Well, maybe it's combination. See? Uh, now, it can also tell us we're right. If it confirms a hypothesis, now we have a theory. So I'll talk about this. And a theory is an explanation, but the difference between it and a hypothesis is a theory has data to back it up. So if we compare it to a hypothesis, the difference is a hypothesis is not tested. Now again, this causes some controversy, right? So just to give you an example, you hear people say this all the time. They will say, oh, well, my friend didn't call me. My theory is his phone died. Or my theory is he got called in to work, right? But that's really a hypothesis, that kind of thing. Right? Now, the reason that's problematic, it's no, not a big deal to use it technically wrong, but in the scientific community, when we say, okay, we have this theory to explain stuff, the general population thinks it's a guess. They think it's really a hypothesis because that, that's how they hear the word. Right? But a theory is backed up by data. 
And again, some other things, there's no such thing as an absolute in science. Everything is really a theory. Uh, there's a word called scientific law. A law is actually a theory that has a lot of data. All right? and, and many theories have been around for decades, even some hundreds of years. And that if they've been around for 100 years, they have a lot of data. But just to give an example, uh, in the early 1800s, there was a lot known about the laws of physics and electromagnetic radiation that we'll talk about later, but specifically physics. And uh, then x-rays were discovered. And what happened at that point is the scientific community said, wow, we didn't even know this was here. And they went back and they had to test a lot of stuff and find out if it was actually x-rays that were causing some things. So that's an example. New information comes out. Sometimes you have to rethink a few things. right? But again, this is examples of the controversy. So climate change, right, is controversial in some people's mind. Actually, most people don't find it controversial, but there are still small groups of people. But the idea that climate change is caused by people, technically it's a theory. It's based on what's called a global climate model, and we'll talk about what feeds into that huge amount of data. We'll do a whole unit on it. But people here, they go, well, no, it's climate theory. Climate theory, it's a theory. They don't, they don't know anything, but they don't realize, no, that theory has data. Evolutionary theory. Right? There's still people, there's still a lot of controversy about that in some areas, in some places, and that's been around for years. There's a huge amount of data. But again, people hear the word theory, they think it's just, no, oh, it's just a theory. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean it's, it, it's real. Okay. Just to shift gears, so just to review, right, observation, something sense, we ask a question about it, then we form a hypothesis to test it. We test the hypothesis with controlled experiments, if the control, which where we test one variable at a time. If the controlled experiments tell us we're right, then we have a theory. And again, the big takeaway from that part as well is a theory is actually tested and there's data. All right, cut just one more slide. All right. Since this is a chemistry class, we're going to do a whole set of slides on no, a whole class on this actually. Let's talk about what is chemistry. So chemistry is a study of matter and its interactions. And like I said, we'll go into that. So I've defined the word matter in terms of, or the word chemistry in terms of matter. The next set of slides is about matter. Just a really brief definition. Matter would be anything that has volume or anything that takes up space. Or you could say it's stuff. There's a very simplifi uh, simplified way of looking at the universe. There's only two things in the universe. There's matter and empty space, which is stuff and the space in between the stuff. It's actually true. It's very oversimplified. Now we're going to spend the next set of slides going through matter. All right, take care, and uh, you'll see, hear from me on the next video.